You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm very pleased to have a special guest on the show. It's a friend of mine called Christoph, who works in in application security. Hi, Christoph. Hey, Jake. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Great. Great to have you. And um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you because uh, one of the subjects that um, I haven't touched on yet that I want to talk about is sort of privacy and security uh, online and in in general using IT because for all of the things that we talk about on the show to do with entrepreneurship to do with investing and finance you know there's a um, a lot of opportunity for people to take responsibility themselves for their own privacy and security so I thought it'd be really good to talk to you about um, you know, ways that you can do that. Um, but perhaps just to start off, could you just give us a, a very brief um, understanding of, you know, your your background in in this sort of area and, and sort of your sort of technical, technical area, so to speak? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I got interested in computer security when I was pretty young. Uh, back in the day, uh, there was still AOL Instant Messenger and stuff like that. And so there was all these people playing around with with networks, and uh, at that point, it wasn't a sophisticated thing for me. I was still learning how to use MS DOS, and uh, you know, finding programs that people had written to kick other people offline and on AOL and Instant Messenger and stuff like that. So it was it's a pretty uh, uh, low level thing, hmm. but um, yeah. So I, I got into that. I, I was fascinated with uh, uh, writing viruses and uh, just figuring out all the bad stuff that you can do with computers. And um, when I went into my university degree, I got a degree in computer science and uh, went into my master's degree for computer science as well. And and, uh, right around the time that my degrees were segueing from one into the other, I really began to focus back into um, computer security, which I had dabbled in for a while, but uh, I was really focusing on that point in a a more... um, in a more uh, uh, a more targeted sense. Mm. Um, so yeah, after that, um, after I got the master's degree, I uh, had some internships and a few different jobs. And um, my current job, I've been an application security consultant for a bit over a year now. Mm. And uh, recently, I presented at a conference with some research. So yeah, I've been really, really getting into it uh, for a while now. Awesome. And uh, privacy and security is is something that's you know, that I've spent a lot of time on. That I think is important for people. Awesome. Well, that's gonna be great because I'm I'm sure that um, the questions that I ask are going to be, you know, completely uh, a ridiculous noob questions. So I look forward to <laughs> to you providing a bit of background. And and I think also you know I'm I'm sure that if people are listening to this in a while, maybe some specific programs might change and some. Sp- uh, so forth, but we'll also talk about sort of the underlying issues. So I think it can still be be useful, even though it is a very fast changing field. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I can start off by just asking about email, because um, I mean it's obviously such a an obvious um, uh, thing to start with. People are sending financial information all the time using email, and there's the the thing that you hear, which, which is sort of the analogy, which is that. Uh, sending something via email is a bit like sending a postcard. I mean, there's, in the sense that it's going through all these servers completely um, open. Uh, I wonder if you could just explain sort of what what the issue is with uh, with security and, and email. Yeah, absolutely. So the the issue with email is that from the user's perspective, it's um, it feels like you're sending. You're taking, you're writing up a letter, and you're kind of you're putting it in an envelope and closing it, making sure that no one can open it, and then it just pops up on the the screen of the other person that receives it, and everything that would happen in between those two points is is hidden from you. So the user experience is that it's this kind of private uh, thing, but there's so much stuff going on in the background that you don't really have any insight into. 
Um, so in general with emails, I mean, I think a good policy is um, unless you're going to start adding in security solutions, you want to put stuff in emails that you would be, feel comfortable with sharing with uh, with people, stuff yeah. that you wouldn't necessarily mind getting out into the public. Um, and that, that should be sort of your default use of email. And yeah. it's certainly the case that if you're, uh, particularly if you're using uh, free email accounts like Gmail or Yahoo Mail or whatever, I think you can expect that there are in fact people that are uh, storing your emails, if not you know an actual human being that's reading it. Mm. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a story in the news about someone that will get busted because you know some some mysterious agency was collecting emails and and something got uh, flagged in their email and right. that started off an investigation. So that's a big thing in the United States and the UK and, and lots of other countries. Right. Um, you can you can certainly add in encryption to an email, um, encrypting the contents of the email. Mm. And there are some tools that you can use that, that are helpful for doing this. Um, one free tool that's out there that's been around for a long time and will probably be around for a long time still um, is uh, the uh, GNU PG project, uh, which is uh, it's a spinoff of the pretty good privacy encryption software that's it's been around for a while, but it's a free open source version. Mm. And I've, I've used it from time to time, um, but it's it's like a lot of other things in security. And there, there are trade-offs, right? So um, w when we're talking about security, first of all, you don't, you don't really know that there are any certain risks out there, right? They're, they're all calculated risks. Mm. And so what you're, what you're looking to do is you're trying to find some nice trade-off between risk and you know the, the ease of usability of these different services and also the cost, of course. Yeah. Uh, and so in the case of this, you know, this free tool for encrypting your email, you can reduce your risk in a, to a significant degree um, but and, and it's a free tool, so there's no cost involved. But it can be a pain in, in the ass to use in terms of usability. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of software out there that's you know helps you out with security, but it's not very friendly to casual users. Yeah, uh, this is one of the things that I'm still I'm surprised is still a, a, looks like a real pain because I mean I've never used um, I've heard of PGP but I've never used it but you you look at things like um, uh, secure sockets layer on on browsers when you mm. when you see that going in uh, when you're on a website and that's all happening in the background and you don't need to know that about the fact that the data being transferred is being encrypted and unencrypted on the way up and down to you and what's surprising is the email clients haven't evolved to the point where you can just switch on encryption and then not see it. Do you know what I mean? It's like you still, as far as I understand, you've got to have this whole faff of, of setting everything up and then, you know, get encrypting and unencrypting and, and, and all of that. And it doesn't seem like email's got to the point where it can just be secure and be used easily. It seems like if you're going to do it, there's a huge administrative overload. Well, not huge, but there is a significant hassle factor um, that, that uh, just hasn't, you know, it doesn't, I, I, it seems like there's a real opportunity there for entrepreneurs to have just solved that problem and for yeah. email to just be secure in the background, you know? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things that play, play there, in there um, in that situation. First of all, uh, SSL, or it's actually known as TLS now for, for website security, the, the real reason why that came to be and why it's stuck is because of e-commerce, mm. of the growth of the growth of e-commerce, people wanted to be able to buy stuff with credit cards online, and both for the the security of the people uh, buying this stuff, not wanting to have their credit card stolen, and also for the credit card companies, that was just a, a technology that, that had to happen. Right, um, and so it's really all about consumer commit uh, consumer demand. Now, if you look at uh, email stuff, I mean, people are just um, pe people don't are not particularly savvy about email. They don't. Most people don't really realize that the lack of encryption in email is an issue, right. a potential issue for them. 
and it's not it's not a technology that is used you know millions of times per per second to uh, to carry over credit card transactions for instance so there's not that critical need for for security um, in that particular service so in general um, if you see that there's a lack of software uh, that makes security easy it's it's that's generally because there's not very much demand for it. Now, there are people that have come up with uh, product solutions for that, and some of them are pretty easy to use. Um, one one that uh, I've heard of before is called Hushmail, which is basically it's like Gmail, but they you know they bake the encryption right into the into the application, right. and but you have to pay a, a, a fee for it, generally speaking. Right, and right. people have just gotten so accustomed to their email being available to them for free, either um, because they use like a, a web mail client, a free web mail client for their home use, or you know maybe for for work, their employer just gives them an email account. Um, so they're so used to you having that stuff available for free that there's not that much interest in mm. paying for a little bit of extra security for email. Yeah, cool. So. To use email, basically, what you said before is, you know, just use it with the um, with the understanding that it is basically open. Or if you really want security, you're going to need to install um, a client that uses um, some variation of PGP or maybe use something like Hushmail. Yes. Right. right. Cool. Okay, so that's, that's email. Um, and I guess that's the privacy side. As far as this um, the security goes, obviously, there's all the stuff that you can... Uh, potentially download via email that can cause you problems um and i mean maybe we come on to all of that stuff uh together because uh, i guess you know viruses and all that stuff is is, is uh, relevant for browsing and everything else <clears throat> so the next thing i wanted to ask you about was browsing um so what about um what about privacy and and browsing <sighs> well the the short answer is that you have very little privacy when you're browsing. Um, modern web browsers these days, the the emphasis on their design is the ability for people to track you, mm. uh, particularly advertisers. It's just become such a big part of the web that uh, the really the emphasis of designing browsers has been to, to facilitate that, but. It, Anything that allows advertisers to track you can also be used by those advertisers or other people to compromise your privacy. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, the general rule of uh, the general uh, thumb of rule for uh, web browser privacy is you you don't have any, mm. and 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 frankly, you can't get it. <laughs> um, there there aren't any really great solutions out there to help you with that. There are some pieces of software that you can use that can help mitigate that to some extent. And you, you are starting to see some um, technologies building into browsers that can help you with that. In general, they're not enabled by, def by default, so you have to kind of go in there and mess with the settings and whatnot. Um, so we're talking about you know disabling cookies when you can. Um, there's plugins for browsers, like NoScript plugin for Firefox that disable JavaScript stuff by default, yeah. but again, you're getting into a trade-off for usability. Where it, when you're turning this stuff off, there's so many websites out there that they're just going to be broken. Yeah, and I mean, I I'm paranoid, so I try to have as much stuff as disabled. But it it adds a bunch of time to my use of the web because I get to some website and it's like, okay, now what kind of stuff do I need to turn back on in order to be able to use this website? And I, right. that's something that I come across practically every website that I use. So yeah, there again, you get into that issue of, of trade-offs, but in, in general, you know, the, the privacy is really bad. Um, there's some uh, studies that have been conducted by the EFF and other organizations where they, they set up uh, websites to people to, to, to visit and they can tell you like, Okay, this is the fingerprint that you have when you visit our website. It's actually, and, and for the vast majority of people, the fingerprint is completely unique because they can tell all these different settings that are going on in your browser, what kind of operating system that you're using, what your IP address is, mm. uh, cookies that you have going on, websites that you've visited, 
um, uh, what versions of plugins like Flash you have installed. I mean, it's just it's crazy. Mm. Um, so again, I think the the default position for using web browsers is to assume that you have little to no privacy on there and you, you have to start adding in things that will probably compromise your usability in order to try and add some privacy back in. Mm. And what about, I mean, I, I've, I've seen um, things like um, uh, the Tor, for example. I, mm. I, but what's, can you explain what that is and, you know, what that does? Yeah, so... The idea of Tor and uh, similar projects, uh, Tor is what's called an onion routing network. And so what's going on there is um, instead of you connecting directly to some web server or some kind of internet service, uh, Tor bounces it around a bunch of people that are participating in this Tor network. Mm. And it comes out so the, 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 the connection actually gets bounced around between people and then there'll, there'll be some person that will serve as sort of an exit node for you that will actually directly connect to the website or service that you're trying to connect to. And then when the website sends something back, it will get bounced back around again and eventually end back up to you. So there's some encryption uh, technology that's going on, t taking place there that's supposed to help anonymize what you're doing. And it certainly will help to anonymize your IP address and some other some other things. So Tor is a great project. Um, I think it's worth checking out. Mm. There are some issues with it, though. I mean, there's still uh, tons of tricky ways for people to compromise your privacy and to reveal your identity, even when you're using the Tor network. There's tons of security research that's right. gone on about that. Um, some problems that just seem like they're fundamentally not solvable at this point. Yeah. Um, and Tor, again, it's a free service, and so uh, it gets back into this triangle of, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to install and to use, I would say, but it, it gets back into this triangle of, um, you know, usability and cost and, and security. So it's adding security in there. It's, it's a free service that you can use, but it's actually pretty slow a lot of the time. Right, right. Um, so, and then... So there are, all, are, are alternatives to Tor. There are other kinds of networks that you can join. Uh, there are uh, VPN services. Uh, VPN is a virtual private network that, that you can join where um, you're getting some of the security benefits of, of something like Tor, but a lot of those services cost money. And mm. so, again, it's a trade-off back to money. A lot of them are very affordable, and I really would recommend VPN to practically anyone to check out um, as a, a possible solution to help them get a bit more privacy on the web. It's particularly important if you're living in a country with a hostile government, like the like the Chinese government is. Right. You know, they're very hostile in terms of uh, internet use, and you know, perhaps the United States will be can fall under that category um, soon. Mm. So, so basically, with a VPN, you sort of achieve something similar to what you would with Tor, but it's probably faster and easier. Is that kind of uh, i know that's probably a very rough summary of what you're saying but is that i think that's a fair yeah i think yeah. that's a fair statement but it's going to cost a little bit more in general generally speaking right uh, vpn is also um it, it's a it's a good uh thing to use if you're doing any kind of torrent downloads right uh, i'm sure that there are quite a few listeners to your show that you know have some issues with intellectual property either as a, a general paradigm or at least the implementation as exists in, in states today. Mm. And so, you know, they don't, they want to, they want to be able to get some of this stuff for free and they, they feel like that's, that's okay. It's, it's ethical, but it can be dangerous to do um, in, in some countries. Uh, you can get slapped with huge lawsuits if you happen to be one of the unlucky few that's picked up for, for torrenting these copyrighted, materials and so uh, VPNs are one of these solutions that can really help out with that if you just do a Google search for um, anonymous BitTorrent or BitTorrent VPN or whatever um, you'll, you'll see a bunch of things you can do some cost comparisons and and uh, that can be a, a quite a good solution right so yeah I was going to ask about that because it basically then that would be that would be the way to anonymize if you are using some kind of file sharing a BitTorrent or something like that a VPN probably would be the, the most effective way to go in terms of making that private right right and in all of these issues the the fundamental uh, root cause of that is the way that the infer the internet 
infrastructure works. And, you know, I think people are sort of generally aware of, of how it works, but it's certainly hidden from your user your user experience. Mm. User experience is always a point to point thing where it's like, you know, I, I click, I type in a website and it pops up and it feels like I'm just directly interacting with this, this website. But the way that the internet actually works is that there are these messages that are being bounced around between all these routers and computers and a route in between you and the service mm -hmm. that you're actually connecting to. And more and more people are looking to place themselves in between in, in that route and do malicious things with that. They can compromise your security right. or your privacy. Right, right. Okay, excellent. So that's very helpful. Um, uh, and. That was um, yeah. So we talked about have, using using VPNs both for web browsing and also for for torrenting. So let's talk about maybe um, you know some of the, uh, the those are privacy issues. What about security and and what about from email and browsing and so forth? Uh, sort of malicious malware that you can pick up and what are you? Do you have any? Obviously, that's a very big field in itself. But do you have any general thoughts about? What, what you should be doing um, with regard to protecting yourself on that level? Yeah, sure. Um, so malware is a significant threat to people. And why malware is a significant threat is because if someone's looking to compromise uh, computers, when they use malware, it's it's got this self-propagating nature to it. So they don't have to pick an individual and target that person and then pick another person and target that person. They just kind of put it out there and it, it, it propagates on its own. And that's really the the benefit of that. And so they're they're really they're not looking to, generally speaking, infect a particular user. They're just looking to infect as many people as possible, um, perhaps within a, a target demographic. Um, and so Malware, you know, typically will come through websites, through uh, email attachments. Um, sometimes it might pop propagate through, uh, you know, more physical means like a thumb drive or something like that. If you get it, some malware that attaches it, it's, itself to your USB stick, and every time you plug it into another computer, it tries to infect that computer. Mm. Um, so. And, and malware is a problem. So there, there are antivirus solutions that are out there. They will help catch some pieces of malware. In general, though, malware authors are winning the battle with antivirus or anti-malware software makers. Right. Um, just there are no antivirus solutions out there that do a great job of catching just about everything. It's just so easy to change a little, tweak a little bit something in the malware and make it evade the filters that are being used. So I think in general, people, you want to have the kind of attitude that um, you, you want to be prepared for having your computer infected. You mm -hmm. want to assume that at any moment your computer could get infected and, and that you can, uh, you can address that. So it's, good to, it's certainly good to install anti-malware software on your computer, but really you want to have some kind of backup plan. And, and what that means is, you know, if your computer, if you realize, if you identify at some point that your computer has been infected, you want to be able to um, have yourself set up so that you can quickly wipe the computer, that you can restore from backups um, that you're being that you're making. And the the general rule for backups is that you don't want to just have one form of backup. You'd like to have uh, multiple mediums of backup. So. Um, you know, there's 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 at least one famous guy that says you should have like three different kinds of backups, and that might be a bit overkill for mm -hmm. for some people. But um, there there are lots of good online solutions for kind of automatically backing up uh, stuff. You can back it up on DVDs at your house or whatever. But the point of having multiple kinds or having backups in multiple places, if your house burns down and you've backed up everything on DVDs at your house, then obviously it's not helpful. Yeah, so uh -oh. it's the off-site backup idea and, and presumably to the cloud is one option, I guess, as well. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are possible security implications with, with backing up and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, some uh, software that does backup stuff is doesn't encrypt your stuff. It might be just your data sitting on a server somewhere. And so now you're actually creating another opportunity for people to snatch your files and right. uh, you know, get into your accounts or whatever. So that's... It's something that you have to be careful for, but yeah, in general with malware, I think that you want to you want to have the attitude that um, you should be prepared to wipe and, and kind of uh, start start over fresh 
um, quickly. Mm. And so that does require a little, it either requires some money on your part to pay someone to do that stuff or to get some, some research on your part. Um, so again, you're, you're getting into that, that kind of trade-off area. Now, just out of interest, there's obviously there's um, the idea that um, that uh, Mac is a lot safer than PC. But w- what are your thoughts on issues to do with uh, viruses and malware on on Macs? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, Macs are still safer for, uh, compared to Windows-based computers at this point. And it doesn't have anything to do at all with Macs being more secure, but it's just a matter of market share. Right, right. Um, so there's just a lot more people developing malware for and viruses for uh, for Windows-based computers because there's a lot more Windows computers out there. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you can expect that the amount of malware out there is going to be directly proportional to what people are using for their computers. Um, and I think, it's, as far as I can tell, you know, Mac still has a positive trend in terms of its market share. And so you can expect to see more and more malware popping up for the Mac. And there have been some you know, big cases of malware infecting millions of Mac computers in a shorter period of time. Right, um, right. So do you, do you use a Mac yourself or a PC? I use uh, Mac for most of my uh, home stuff. And do you run antivirus software on your home PC? Uh, I have a free antivirus um, software um, that I run. I think it's called Clan XAV. Uh, but you can you can do you know people that are listening they can do some research into what might work best for them. Yeah. I think any any kind of uh, computer that you have you you want to have some kind of mal- anti malware solution installed on there. Mm, cool. All right, great. So that that's that's useful, I think, and I do understand what you're saying about backups. Now, what, okay. one other thing oh, about yeah, sorry, malware, ahead. just so there are, certainly are things that you can do to try and avoid getting malware on your computer. I mean, I think in in some sense, uh, it, it, it it's probably just a matter of time for anyone that they get some kind of malware on their computer. And uh, I mean, even if if you take a very broad definition of malware, at, right now you and I both have malware running on our computers but they're in very they can do very limited stuff because they're you know in browser cookies or, or whatever like the, right it's, it's not a full compromise of your computer kind of malware but uh, there are th- things that you can do um you know in it and there there are plenty of good educational materials on uh, out there um if you just do a google search for you know how to avoid malware or something like yes, that, there, yeah. there's some simple tips that you can follow that uh will help you avoid it and, and give you some street sense in terms of oh you know this there's a file attached to this email I wasn't expecting the email maybe I should I shouldn't yeah, download that or I, or I need to be very careful about how I do it or that kind of stuff absolutely yeah cool excellent all right now this is one that I think is um, is uh, can be very interesting to talk about and that's general care of your passwords and password sort of. Uh, hygiene i suppose um because obviously now everyone's got um accounts multiple accounts at various websites and passwords and so forth and there are password managers out there um at, that uh, that you can use but um you know what are your thoughts about what the what are kind of um good approaches to managing your passwords yeah well passwords are they're a terrible uh a device or, or technology for access control. They're they're worse than just a, they're they're worse than everything else that there is as a, another option. You know, uh, it's it's like democracy. So <laughs> so yeah. I mean, if you the the idea that you just have these obscure these obscure strings that you have to construct and they have to, there's all these rules about how they have to be formed. And for a long time, people are saying you have to memorize them because you can't write them down. It's like just, there's so much stress that's bound up in the user experience around passwords. Mm. Um, and I, I still experience that and it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's a failure on the part of, of people that design software that we're still using the silly stuff, but, um, but it's, it's what we have for now. So, I think that um, there there are some important things that you have to keep in mind with passwords, and that there's 
there's kind of two important attack scenarios that you have to be aware of with respect to passwords that that, that lead to some kind of account compromise. One is, is called an offline attack and the other one's called an online attack. So an online attack, the idea is, uh, let's say you have a Gmail account or whatever, mm. and someone's trying to get into your Gmail account. And, and let's say that Gmail for, I don't think this is the case, but let's say that Gmail, it just, if, if, if someone tries to log in to an account and it's a bad, it just keeps letting you do it, trying it over and over and over. And there's no, there's no time delay or anything like that. So if you have a crappy password, and, and, and the person's trying to get into your email account, then they're just going to try A, they're going to try B, they're going to try A, B, C. They're just yeah. going to try, go th iterating through all these different possibilities. And that, that would be an online attack because they're actually interacting with the Gmail server to, to test these uh, password or, or, yeah. or login attempts. Um, and as it turns out, attackers don't actually, they don't, they don't try all of the different possible combinations because there's just too many of them, right? But what they know is that most users are, are not informed about this kind of stuff. And so users tend to use very similar passwords to each other. And a lot of times they end up using, you know, the same passwords. Yes. There's a, if, if, you, if you look around, there's all these lists of like the top 20 most common, you know, you, passwords that are out there or whatever. And it's embarrassing how many people or that are just using these ridiculously simple passwords. Right, and it's, right. It's because they, they, they're, very, they're very focused on the usability of the situation. They don't want to deal with this, this login crap. They just want to get in and use the software, which mm. I, I can perfectly empathize with. I mean, it's a pain to, to try and deal with this stuff. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that would be the online attack. The offline attack is, oh, okay, uh, someone's not trying to brute force the Gmail passwords. What they've actually done is they've somehow hacked into the Gmail accounts and they've downloaded a list of all of the accounts and passwords to their personal computer. Now, if that... That's if what's, sorry to interrupt, but that's what happened to LinkedIn recently, isn't it? It happened to LinkedIn. It's happening to websites every single day. I mean, it's constant. And, and there's so many news stories that are out there about that stuff. And those are only the ones that are getting disclosed, which is, is really just the tip of the iceberg. So this is happening on a massive scale of people downloading these, these account lists from compromised servers. Interesting. And so if, if uh, Gmail or one of the, the, these other services, uh, if they are storing the, the password in plain text, well, it's game over. They've got all the passwords and, and usernames, and it, that's just going to be, they can get into anyone's account until Gmail figures this out and they do something to you know, lock the accounts down or whatever, right? Mm. So if, if that's the case, then it, you've got a problem. Now, there, there are different ways that they can try and encrypt the passwords and, and make it more difficult for attackers. And that's where we get into the, the, um, the scenario of the offline uh, attack on these passwords, where they're trying to crack the passwords. Um, so the, the passwords are stored in some kind of encrypted form that they've downloaded, and they're trying to, they're trying to figure out what that password is by uh, basically uh, generating a password encrypting it in the same way that the website did and then comparing the two to see if they match up. And so if you have a really weak password at that point, what an attacker is going to try to do is they're going to try to use this list of common passwords or um, or they're going to start generating lists of, of common patterns of passwords, right? And they're going to try and crack your password that way. Mm. And they've got the encrypted form of your password already. So that's, yeah, you know, it's just a matter of time. If you have a weak password, it's just a matter of time for them to be able to, to get around to the, the password that, that is yours. If you have a super strong password, they might not ever be able to crack it, you know, depending on how it was encrypted and, and uh, the strength of the password and, and so, so forth. So it really does pay off to have a complex, uh, uncommon, uh, complicated password. Yeah. Uh, because these comp and there These are, compromises are having all the time. Right, right. And there are a lot of guidelines out there, again, that I know people can Google about how to create long, complex uh, uh, passwords and so forth. Um, yes. But so that's the problem. Um, what is the, you know, what's the best approach as a solution, given that we do have to live with this um, technology and this approach? You know, what's your thoughts on uh, what you should be doing to manage your passwords? 
you should be using a password manager. Um, password managers allow you to come up with random passwords so that you don't have to you don't have to remember all these passwords. That they you know it, it, there's no limit on how complex they can be really, except for what the you know the the services that you're using if they have some kind of restrictions on passwords. Mm. Um, and also they make they they allow you to not share passwords between websites. So imagine if you have uh, one password that you're using for Gmail, you're using the same password for another website, and it's super complex or whatever. But the second website, you you have no idea, but they're storing your password in plain text. Someone mm -hmm. gets in there, they compromise the passwords. Now they have the password to your Gmail account too, even though you went through all this effort to come up with a complex password for your Gmail. So not sharing passwords between accounts is is super important. I would also say that if possible, you should try to avoid uh, sharing usernames between websites. And that can be quite tricky. A lot of websites um, allow uh, or they, they require you to use email addresses for your account name or whatever. But it, it being a, sharing usernames between websites can be uh, tricky too because if someone's trying to do some kind of targeted attack on you, um, that makes that it makes your username between websites predictable. If they know that your username for one website is Jay Smith, then they're just going to try. They're just they have a list of a hundred different most common websites. They're going to look up to see if Jay Smith is an account on any of those websites and, and start and have at it. Right. So, that's a that's a good point. That's a very good point. So you it, it actually would help then to create some difference between your username in your different uh, accounts even though ev like probably the majority of people are using uh, just a variation on their initial surname or their first name surname or something like that right right yeah yeah and that's something that's not brought up too often it's it's less important than the password aspect it but it's still uh pretty relevant to security i would say mm. um so Password managers also, if you if it's available and and you're willing to use it, some kind of two-factor authentication is quite helpful. I know that's available for uh, Gmail, for games like the Battle.net service, and what that means is um, they're gonna uh, or, or for bank accounts sometimes, like Bank of America does that. Yeah. So if you enable this, what that means is um, you're gonna have to, in addition to providing your password, you're gonna have to provide something else. And typically, it will be some kind of challenge response scenario where they send, for instance, a text to your mobile phone, mm. and then you, and then it will say your code is this. It's good for the next minute or so. You type that in after you've typed in your password. So if someone does get a handle on your password, if they don't have your cell phone as well, they can't get into the account, which is great. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you basically, make sure you've got two-factor authentication turned on if you're using Gmail or any other service that you can use two-factor authentication for. Yeah, and, and the more important the account is to you, the more it's important for you to, to be using things like that. Uh, something like a bank account, I think, two-factor authentication is very, very important. Um, hmm. uh, you do not, or you really don't want someone to log into your bank account and wipe out your account. That could create a big headache for you. Yeah. On, on the other hand, if it's your Farmville account or something like that, maybe you don't care. Um, right, right. Yeah, and 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 there I do have uh, accounts that are basically throwaway accounts to me, like that for whatever reason the website requires me to type in the password, but I don't care at all if someone logs into my account, and so I'll just set something simple. I don't store it in the password manager. It's I could it could be the word password. I don't care. You know? Yes, yes, but because. You, because you're not intending to use that account for anything at all uh, important or financial or anything like that. It's just that you you want to get access to some kind of uh, web page or whatever, and they force you to to log into an account. Right. So I think it's worthwhile to think about how important a piece of information or data or account is to you, and for you to make your your level of security, the level of effort that you put into that, commensurate with its importance to you. Mm. Um, you don't want to get into the habit of always using throwaway accounts because that, you know, that could be a bad habit, but I think it's, I think it's reasonable to exercise judgment in that kind of way. And I think any computer user has enough common sense that they, they can exercise that kind of judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, that that's really, really helpful. And I'm um, mm. just on, on password managers. I'm sure that, you know, different specific firms will change over time and and so forth so probably the best thing is people should look up for themselves 
what they think might be the best um, you know, specific provider as a password manager. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to ask you about that, though, is that isn't there an issue if you... Obviously, it would be nice to have a password manager that you use on your on your laptop and on your phone and so forth. And then you're surely getting into an issue where you're going to have to have the database of passwords accessible by both devices. So mm-hmm. what do you think about... Is that... I mean, I guess that can be encrypted itself, but um, how is that an issue that you that you have uh, tackled yourself? Yeah, uh, it, it is an issue. And there are some services that do it right. And there are some services that completely fail at it. Nice. <laughs> so there, there are there are some great applications. I've heard great things about LastPass, for instance, that, mm. where people say, this is the best password manager. You know, get the premium account. It's cheap, uh, cheap cost per, per month or whatever. And uh, they, just, they do everything right. Everything is encrypted in the right way. And then there are other applications that are out there that are cheap or free. And basically what they do is they take all your passwords, they store them on plain text in their server. It's not being encrypted in transit. You know, it's not being encrypted with the HTTPS or, or TLS or SSL or anything like that. It's actually just you, you know, uh, just pulling your, just exposing your passwords to anyone that wants to snoop in on it. And they say that they're providing the security service when in fact all they're doing is exposing your passwords to the world wow that's actually probably worse than just the just oh it's it's absolutely worse it's it's absolutely worse so you do want to do some research in that kind of stuff you don't want to just see oh this is a security product yeah this must be increasing my security i've downloaded it good i'm good to go Mm. right excellent that's very helpful another thing that i wanted to ask you about is um Voice over IP and chat, because mm-hmm. um, I remember, in fact, I was reading um, uh, a book that was talking about Skype being one of the good things about Skype being it, it's encrypted and the chat's encrypted, too. And that's cool. But also recently, there's been a lot of talk about how Skype, uh, you know, are making their security procedures more open for government to look at and so forth. And, and so mm-hmm. You know, you kind of wonder what's going on in terms of security there as well. So just in terms of uh, uh, voice over IP and and chat, any any thoughts about security and privacy of those? Well, I, I think Skype is good. Um, if you're just sitting at a cafe or something like that and, and uh, using the Wi-Fi, uh, pretty sure that Skype, you know, they, they've got proper encryption going on. And so... It's not like someone's going to be uh, snooping in on your call just because you're using a Wi-Fi network. Mm. Um, so I think Skype is good, and I think they encrypt both the the voice chat and and also the the text chat that you do over Skype. Yeah, um, there are other uh, instant messenger protocols out there that don't do encryption, and so um, you you do want to keep in mind that if there is some uh, that person that's a longer route that's trying to snoop in or whatever they can they can read that chat. Uh, if you're on a an open unencrypted Wi-Fi network at Starbucks or something like that, then people can read that text. Mm. And so um, you want to you know treat your your conversations uh, accordingly. Right. Um, there there are some good plugins that you can use for different chat things that can help with that with privacy and security. Like off the record is one. Um, so yeah. Right. Cool. All right. Well, that's um, yeah, that's that's useful. I guess people can can look that up and uh, and and look at that. How when, about when I, I'll, I'll make one quick note about the Skype government thing, right? So, yeah. uh, governments are huge, and they have lots of incentive to snoop on people, to 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 hack them, to to do all this stuff, and they just have so much money to throw at the issue. So, if you are really worried about a government snooping on your what you're doing on the computer or um, trying to hack you or something like that and you, you may have excellent reason to be concerned about that it's not an invalid concern you want to make sure that you're really doing your research because there's a lot of ways that they can try to to get into what you're doing uh, they can use legal means a lot of time uh, if they can just su- submit a subpoena to your internet service provider and get all kinds of information on you and your ISP can't even you know, give you a heads up or, or say no to it or whatever, because it's just they've they've got the gun, you know, and, yeah. and tons of tons of tax money to spend on on this stuff. So that is a significant problem. I think the majority of people out there, their lives won't be in, impacted by government 
uh, trying to you know catch them doing stuff on the internet, but but you do you need to do some research if that's something that you're genuinely concerned about. Mm-hmm. Cool. So how I, I think another thing that I wanted to ask you about was just generally uh, security for your uh, data storage. You know, we've talked about the issue of backing up just just in terms of you know potentially losing your stuff. But also, um, you know, I wonder what your thoughts are about um, whether or not you should encrypt your storage and what you should think about when storing things online in the cloud and so forth, um, just in terms of, you know, the privacy and security of your information. Yeah. Well, my, my opinion is that if, if at all feasible, you should always try to encrypt your data in practically every way that it can be encrypted. There's so many ways of your of for data that's stored somewhere to get out of your hands. Uh, let's say someone breaks into your apartment and steals your laptop or you leave it somewhere. Mm. Or mobile phones. I mean, people are losing mobile phones all the time. The majority of them, their their files are not encrypted. Um, so there's all kinds of, and, and the, you know, as technology progresses, things are becoming increasingly more throwaway, more one-time use, more mobile. Uh, it's getting away from these big, heavy computers that you can never take anywhere. So it's even more likely that you're going to to lose your device uh, at some point. Or maybe maybe you want to just it gets old and you want to sell it, you know. But yeah. there are maybe people that are out there buying up computers and looking for account information on those hard drives or something like that. Right. So you you definitely want to do as much uh, encryption of data as as possible. When it comes to the cloud stuff, again, I would rec- you know seriously recommend. Um, trying to use services that um, you know have good reviews in terms of their encryption of your data. There was a big kerfuffle a while ago about Dropbox and and how they were really not doing proper encryption of of stuff that was stored on their servers, um, and so it was really easy for for governments or or uh, other kinds of attackers to try and get at that data. So, yeah, um, as a consumer of software, uh, spend a little bit of time and, and, and research to make sure that the software they're using is being properly encrypted. And don't, don't take the word, don't take the word from the person that's making the software. Cause what they're generally going to say is, oh yeah, we're using, we're using encryption. We're using, we're using military level encryption. Right. Well, if they're not doing it the right way, then it doesn't matter. And mm. actually, I think a majority of solutions out there are not doing it the right way in, in some fashion or another. So, you know, try to get some independent opinions on that. What you mean basically consumer reports and reviews and so forth, industry yeah. reviews, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. And um, okay, and so that's that's very uh, that's very useful. So I guess um, those are the, kind of the main uh, the main areas that came to mind for me in terms of your privacy and your security and the things that you as an individual can do sort of to take responsibility for yourself and basically kind of good housekeeping, so to speak, on those things. Uh, is there anything that you think is, is really important uh, that we haven't talked about so far to touch on? Well, one thing I was thinking about was um, one thing that you've talked quite a bit about on, on the show that I really enjoyed is entrepreneurship mm. and uh, starting up businesses. And I think, you know, just increasingly, if you have some kind of business these days, you're going to have a website for it. Um, the area that I've been working on the, the most deeply is application security, which is basically in this realm of, of helping to secure websites, of making secure web applications. Mm. And so I have a few thoughts about that. I would say if you have a startup, um, Security is obviously not going to be your primary issue. Uh, other much, much more important things are getting functionality into the application, getting users, getting funding for your business. Mm. And so um, I, I don't want to join security alarmists in saying that, oh, security, it's this the most important thing in the world and you need to spend all of your money and time on security and securing your applications and all that kind of stuff. But there is a, an economic, and this is, this is, I think, pretty well established at this point through, through studies. There is an economic aspect to uh, security of websites and, and applications for businesses. And it's, 
It's the following. The longer that you wait to try and make sure that your service is secure, the more money that you will end up paying to try and secure it. Right. And so, uh, and, and there's been quite a few companies out there that they experience a lot of financial heartache because they are really, really focused on all the business aspects of, of what's what's um, of their their service and, and building the user base and adding functionality and all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff is extremely important. And then they get to some point where they realize, oh man, you know, we've really made it at this point. And there's all these people that are trying to break into our stuff. And, you know, our customers weren't talking about this before, but now they're like, you know, what's what's going on here? I want to make sure that people are not breaking into my accounts or stealing my my data or, or my my money or whatever. And and all of a sudden they expect this high level of security um, that you know only arises once the, the service has gotten really big and it's got all these it's got this big you know target uh, painted on it. And at that point they have to spend they have to shell out tons of money to try and bring in people to help them secure their stuff. Whereas if they had gotten you know, once they had gotten to the point where they had gotten some initial funding, they've got you know a, a, a solid user base um, uh, of clients or whatever, and then they started to bake in the security, you know, little little by little and steadily as it as it went through the development process, then they would have ended up spending way less money um, trying to secure the the service, mm -hmm. and they can also use that to try and differentiate themselves from competitors to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, awesome. No, I think that's really, really good point, and uh, definitely something to consider because uh, I'm sure m most of the people who uh, who are interested in entrepreneurship and listening to this uh, uh, have some uh, online presence of some kind, even if it's not really an online business. They've still got to think about the security aspects as well. So I think that's great. Well, that that is really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Christoph. I really appreciate all your thoughts on that, and. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask, is there, um, is there anything that you uh, think people should um, look out for in terms of uh, stuff that you're doing, or if not yourself, uh, stuff that you think is, is going to be interesting to look out for in the future as far as sort of n new developments in this field? Um, let's see. Um, no, I, I think in this field... There's there's a lot of cyclical uh, there's a, there's a real cyclical nature to it. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, and so I think that the most important thing that you can do is just try to stay, just try to dip your toe in the water every once in a while, and try to stay a little bit informed about what the developments are. Um, I think if you could, you know, subscribe to a security podcast, for instance, and just listen to an episode every once in a while. I like it. Um, there's a podcast called Security Now, which I think is uh, pretty accessible um, right. in, in terms of their, their coverage of security stuff. Or if you just want to read, you know, an article about, you know, um, some security stuff every, every once in a while and just try to stay abreast of, of what, what kind of changes are there are going on. I mean, I'm going to probably be in this field for, you know, a while still. I'll still be doing research, but the you know, people that are doing the kind of research that I'm doing, it's very niche. It's mm. not um, it's not critical for anyone to, to, to know about in terms of their day-to-day their -day stuff. Mm. And so, yeah, I would just say to kind of dip your, your toe in the water every once in a while and, and um, make sure that you're that you're thinking about this stuff, keeping keeping abreast of what the, the patterns are and whatnot and, and making, making sure that you're making good decisions as a consumer with respect to security stuff. Brilliant. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your, all of your uh, thoughts on, on this uh, discussion. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.